This is Auto Line After Hours with John McElroy and Gary Vasilash, episode 595 for April 7th of 2022, talking all about the shift crew. Watch Auto Line After Hours live at AutoLine.tv every Thursday at 3 p.m. Eastern Time. That's 12 p.m. Pacific. You can subscribe to this podcast for free by searching for AutoLine in iTunes, Stitcher, or YouTube. AutoLine After Hours is brought to you by Bridgestone Tires, solutions for your journey. Hey, Gary, you ready to do a show? Absolutely, John. How are you doing? I'm doing great. Doing really yeah. good. So, you know, I, I know that we don't do the what happened today in history, but today I had to go get my eyes examined and I went to Henry Ford Health System to get my eyes examined. And I just got to say, today in 1947, Henry Ford died. So just. Oh, today was the day. Huh? Yeah. Yeah. Very interesting. Mm -hmm. You know, a, a little history story here. The day he died, you know, he had his house by the Rouge River. It flooded and he had his own electric generating power station there that ran off the river. And because everything flooded, uh, the lights went out and they went out. So the story goes, so the, the historic lore goes, it all went out literally the moment he died. And so all the clocks which ran on electricity in the house were stopped at the moment of his death. Sounds uh, a little apocryphal, John. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> a wee bit. Just so everybody knows that story. Uh-huh. Well, thanks for sharing that. And uh, so we should bring in our colleague, uh, Mark Williams from, from L.A. How are you doing? How did you figure out I'm in yeah, LA? Yeah, yeah. I have no idea. I, it's, you know, I, I got those eyes checked and I can read. So that's uh, very good. Well, in honor yeah. of the Rams and the Dodgers, who I think are going to win the World Series next year. So we'll see. Mm -hmm. Always the optimist. <laughs> yes. Yeah. So let's let's bring in uh, Daryl Adams, the CEO of Shift Group. Hello, Daryl. Hello, John. Gary, Mark, how you guys All doing? Right. Good. So you, you got to give us a, a thumbnail brief description of what the shift group is. I know what you, you guys do all kinds of specialty trucks, but you yep. take it from there, Daryl. Tell us what you guys do. Uh, you're, you're spot on. So we, we build specialty vehicles um, in all types of uh, industries. So <clears throat> parcel, uh, linen, we also do service bodies. That would be, you know, AT&T, power companies, things like that, uh, as well as uh, motorhome chassis uh, for the large motor coaches. And then, um, every Isuzu truck you see uh, on the road, uh, was probably built by us here in North America. We've been doing, uh, Zuzu contract manufacturing, uh, for oh, probably no. 10 years or so. I did not know that. Yeah. So people might be familiar with the company with its previous name, which was Spartan Motors. Is that correct? Yeah, very <clears throat> correct, Gary. Um, we were Spartan Motors, uh, located in Charlotte, Michigan. Uh, for a number of years, the company was founded in 1975 uh, with a couple laid off uh, engineers from the auto industry, started building fire truck chassis. Um, and ironically, uh, in 2020, so about 25 years later, um, uh, we sold the fire truck division. And at that time, we needed to change the name of the company. So we landed on the shift group. Hmm. Daryl, how's business these days? And the reason I ask is, you know, the, the auto industry is in so much turmoil over, you know, first it was COVID, then the chip shortage. I, I'm hoping you guys haven't been clobbered by all that. <laughs> well, I, um, we, we are touched by it for sure. Uh, if we go back to COVID, as you mentioned, right, because we were deemed uh, critical and essential um, because our customers needed their vehicles to maintain the infrastructure or deliver as you can imagine, online uh, ordering packages, right? With FedEx, Amazon, UPS, USPS, <laughs> we build for all of them. And they were asking for their trucks. So we had to go through all kinds of protocols and kept adjusting with the CDC uh, as, as COVID came on. But, um, you know, today, uh, as, as the auto industry is struggling to, with supply and chips and other things, um, we use a lot of their chassis, obviously. So we're, we're being touched by it as well. Hmm. So, so Daryl, explain this to me. Okay. Um, 
I'm, I'm sure most of the viewers like me would be used to going to a dealer and buying a vehicle. Mm -hmm. And let's say that we were going to buy a, a truck and we were going to go maybe maybe do an outfitter. Um, what is it that you guys do? I mean, it's it's all special or there are standards that people buy or I mean, how, how does this work? Yeah. So if we take um, what the, the company was founded on would be Utilimaster. Um, we take a chassis, strip chassis, and we will build the entire vehicle around it. So if you look at a UPS, typical large delivery van or FedEx, um, that we know bread trucks would be the same type of a look. We build those, we get the raw chassis, we build everything up from the, the bottom up. Um, if we look at some of the other vehicles, we do touch outfitting. If you take a transit cargo van, for example, we would outfit the inside of that. Um, and we did start something uh, new back in, in 2020, which is our velocity vehicle, which is a, a niche vehicle. It's in a class three space. So there was a gap between class two and, and obviously class four or five and six, which is three. Um, so we jumped in and developed a, a unique walk-in van purpose-built in class three on a transit chassis or a ProMaster chassis or a Sprinter chassis. Did you guys go after the post office contract? John, we were in, uh, involved in that when it first came out. Uh, but at the time when I joined the, and took over the company in 2015, uh, it was a bit of a turnaround. And if you remember that contract, I think was in 16 when it came out. Um, and it wasn't, uh, it was a competitive uh, bid. So I think there were seven uh, companies that had to build prototypes. Um, and at the time we didn't have the, the the money to spend on the R and D, um, so we actually backed out. And in hindsight, I think um, you know how many years later, right? Six years later was a pretty good decision. Yeah, blessing in disguise. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> All right. So let's talk. You're coming out with an electric van now, right? We are. Um, in June of of last year, uh, we announced in our analyst day that we were going to uh, come out with an EV chassis, an EV body. Um, and, and the reason we did that, which is called Blue Arc today, we announced that at the uh, NTA truck show in March down in Indianapolis. We've been looking for a chassis. Um, so in the ice space, John, internal combustion engine, we are agnostic to the chassis. So we can build on anybody's chassis. And we wanted to stay that same way in the EV space, not to alienate any of our customers. Um, but we couldn't. I'm sorry, OEM chassis providers. We couldn't find um, anything but a skateboard. Um, and we went to some of these startups. They wanted to uh, us to spend eight million, ten million dollars to for them to develop it. Well, we looked back and said, you know, we've been building chassis for almost 50 years, right? We've been building bodies for at least 50 years. Why don't we take those two core competencies, put them together? And, and that's what, uh, you know, got the team, uh, which we have a great team here at the Shift Group, got the team together and decided that we could actually build our own EV since we couldn't find a chassis uh, that's viable. And, you know, some people call us the anti-startup because we're an existing company, right? So um, I'm sure we're going to have a lot more names by the time we're done, but uh, we'll take that one. <laughs> So do you have orders for the, I mean, it, this is not a build it and they will come approach or is it? Um, it is. Uh, and I think if you take our, uh, the history that we've had in the last mile delivery space um, and in the specialty vehicle space, we understand the customer's expectations. Uh, we know the range they need. We know, and, and there's a lot to it, right? We don't feel our customers are going to change their entire process and how they deliver packages or run their warehouses or distribution centers. Um, so a lot of the, the uh, startups or the class two vehicles aren't at the same height when they come to a dock. Our vehicles are the exact same parameters on bumper height, right? Wheelbase, tire size that we use in our typical walk-in vans in the class four ice space. So we took those parameters changed it, made it look a little bit nicer, as you can see on the screen here, softer edges on it. Um, and it, it uh, is the exact, the first step is the same, right? The second step, the, the height of the driver. So we understood all that, the shelving package that you can see in there is lighter weight 
Um, but we took all our knowledge and put it into this vehicle. So is, is this a class three or a class four vehicle or a different class? This, our blue arc, uh, chassis is a class three chassis. Um, we do have, um, I think there was a picture on there of our, uh, power cube, um, and what John and, and Gary and Mark, what I like to, to boil things down into simplistic method, messages, uh, I tell the team we have to be agile, nimble, flexible, proactive, and solution-based. Um, so we couldn't find a chassis, so we were proactive and went to build our own. We talked to our customers. They felt that they didn't have the infrastructure uh, to power and charge these. Uh, because at night they use most of their power to run their conveyors uh, and, and power the um, package loading of the vehicles. So we developed the power cube, which could charge with the solar panels, but also on, on power from the building during the day when the trucks are moving around the neighborhoods and come back, the batteries are all charged up and then they could just charge multiple vehicles off of a power cube and they don't have to put in extra power uh, if it's a leased facility or, or they can't get enough in the area, this is, and we think this would be really good if we look at some natural disasters, if there's a, a FEMA requirement or something where there, a hurricane comes through, we could drop these in and have them already charged and then we could replace them with a new one and it would be charged. We take it further away and charge it where there's power. That's fascinating, Daryl. I mean, you guys are chassis and bodybuilders. How did you come up with uh, talent and the resources to do this power cube? And conversely, or, or along with that, develop the, the battery pack, electric motors and everything for this blue arc. Yeah, I think if you, you look back, um, John, we started this in June of 2021. We had a, a chassis that was powered and driving in December. Wow. And we put a brand new ground up, brand new chassis and a brand new body and we had it in the show in less than nine months <laughs> and that's just taken all those years of experience and the knowledge of the engineering team and but i do have to say we're also leveraging our supply base right so uh proterra is our battery supplier we're working with them quite a bit right and and we have the e-axle from dana so we're using automotive components right that have been tested um so it helps us with testing and it gives us comfort that our customers are going to have a long lasting chassis and a truck when they put it into the field. Mm -hmm. Okay, Mark, ask him something truck oriented. <laughs> uh, uh, I'll get to that. But uh, right now uh, I've been retired for a few years, but my favorite auto show of the year, and maybe this is blasphemous for saying it, is, is the work truck show every year that happens in March in Indianapolis. Yeah, it's blasphemous. <laughs> because it is so solutions oriented. You have truck manufacturers who can specifically tell you what problem they're trying to solve. And then you get to look at the product that they are throwing out there to solve that problem. That, that's wonderful. Um, this, this is interesting and it's sexy, but, but why uh, sexy in the sense that uh, all at least the uh, kind of personal use pickup truck manufacturers are diving in to electric vehicles and electric pickup trucks and electric work, if you will, um, which makes sense. But it, I just don't know how much push or demand for that is from truck guys interested in that kind of technology. It's probably where we're going. It makes so much more sense to me, and we've talked about it here, that these kind of, uh, you know, built in routes, these 120 mile routes you do every single day out and back and then plugging in at nighttime makes perfect sense for customers who are delivery based or at least route based. But what's what's your sense? Why why did the auto manufacturers do something that seems commonsensically so obvious for the delivery segment or the work truck segment? Yeah, it's, um, again, it's obviously there's not a lot of data around what people are thinking, but our opinion, Mark, is uh, their comfort zone is in a class two space. And that's why we didn't enter the class two space. Um, you know, and I also tell the team we have to stay in our, our swim lane. 
our swim lane is class three up to class six, maybe a little bit of seven. Um, and we can have solutions in all of those. Uh, we already have on the drawing board a class five uh, EV chassis, right? And I think um, what's unique about at least our EV solution at the shift group and, and Blue Arc is all the routes aren't the same. So if you're in a big city like New York or Chicago or LA, you may not put 120 miles on your vehicle in a day. Uh, but if you have an ICE engine, you have the same engine, the same transmission, the same fuel tank size, right? Same engine displacement. We can tailor our battery size to a smaller battery, which is now gives you a lighter vehicle, gives you more payload, and the cost is significantly less because it's based on kilowatt hours for the battery size. So um, those are some of the things that, you know, from our knowledge of our customer base, we're, we're bringing into that vehicle. So let's talk about payload and towing capacity. Is that is that an issue for delivery vehicles or this kind of platform? No, towing capacity is not. Um, but payload obviously um, is is something that uh, they're all looking for. And and I think when you when you look at the class two vehicles, they're struggling right now with the payload size getting to where the customer needs it to be. And I think that's only because they're under ten thousand GVW. And if you put a battery in there to get to 120 miles, the payload is just the math equation, right? And uh, you're not going to get the payload that the customers are wanting. So, um, yeah, our payload is plenty uh, for the customers, and we can even tailor that based on a battery size. So smaller battery means I get more payload capacity? Sure. So if, if you don't need 120 miles, why why put a 100, you know, 165 kV H battery in it. But the other thing that I think is is unique about our design um, is our battery is between our two frames. So we designed this frame from the ground up. We didn't take a, an ICE uh, class five or class four chassis and stick a battery underneath it or on the outsides, which to me could be dangerous if the battery is is can be hit by something. Um, so we protected ours within the frame rails. Right, and all the uh, high voltage cables run inside the frame rails as well. So, um, the unique piece is if you want to change that battery, you can drop it down through the bottom. So, if you take a vehicle that you want to move to a, a longer route, if you will, we could put a different size battery up into it. Uh, I don't want to say it's as easy as plug and play, but it might take you an hour to put a bigger battery in it and it can go a, a longer distance. Mm -hmm. Would this be something that the customer would be able to do, or is this something that you guys would need to send a technician over to make sure it was done right? Uh, Gary, our design is going to be where the customers or uh, their maintenance, vehicle maintenance department could do it. Um, it's it's going to be that simple. Honestly, it's changing out. You know, I don't have the exact diameter of the bolts, but let's say uh, five eighths bolts, right? Maybe you have uh, 20 of them or 30 of them. Um, and some support to hold the battery because they are heavy. Drop it down with a, some type of a lift, pull it out, and put the new one in. Mm -hmm. Daryl, how confident are you that you can get batteries if uh, orders start pouring in for this uh, electric van? Yeah. So, uh, John, my background is, as I mentioned, uh, probably in the in the green room, is uh, spent a lot of time uh, at Lear Corporation um, in in the auto industry, right, in the supply base. And... Um, at the time, we probably didn't like LTAs with uh, with all of our customers, but um, we are working with uh, LTAs with our battery. So the key components. Explain uh, LTA for the audience here. Sure. Long-term agreement so that uh, will guarantee you some level of volume for a number of years and, and a bunch of other legal uh, aspects in it. But we do have batteries uh, assigned to this vehicle on an increasing rate uh, for a five-year contract. So we should be all set. That's great. So, and, so and I'm asking batteries. I got to squeeze this in. How about chips? How are you doing on chips? <laughs> John, that's probably a, a multi-billion dollar question right now. Is uh, <laughs> um, actually that, that again? That's the uh, the main reason why the auto industry is is in some um, disarray right now, and and we're struggling with chips as well. Yeah. Um, but I think you know when we look at it um, as a company, we look at our backlog. And our backlog continues to grow. Um, it's, it's not a demand issue for us. 
it's a supply issue and the chassis. So uh, the demand is there because if you think about it, in, in 2020, they couldn't buy the replacement vehicles or they couldn't even get the, the growth vehicles that they wanted. So that was 2021 and it's already halfway through 22, if you say. So they have two and a half years of not being able to replace vehicles and buy growth vehicles. So um, we see the, the growth uh, trend for, for a few more years. Hmm. Daryl, you you set up Blue Arc as basically a standalone brand within the Shift Group. Right. Um, do you see having those vehicles basically being another offering you have within the Shift Group portfolio? Meaning that there will still be customers who will say, "We want to buy a gasoline engine," "We want to buy a diesel engine," and some will say, "We want to buy the electric vehicle." Yeah, well, Gary, we do. We see, um, and. You know, our traditional gasoline ice engines uh, or chassis or diesel, um, we have a 15 year life on those vehicles. So if, you know, our, our customers have talked about um, their green initiatives to be carbon neutral by 2030, 2040, 2050, right? Depends on who they are. Um, so if you look at that, right, we're in 2022, if we don't start building vehicles pretty soon and get them on the road, to replace some of those 15 year old vehicles, it's gonna push their green initiatives out because they're not gonna throw away a vehicle that still has five years of life on it, right? So uh, we do believe we'll still be uh, building ICE chassis and ICE engines and uh, sorry, uh, vehicles going forward for the foreseeable future because, right? I also do think that the range we have today and the batteries, I think that's gonna only continue to increase as battery technology continues to be refined um, and everyone is is working to to get longer range of batteries. So Daryl, uh, who do you think is going to buy your electric van? Uh, it's going to be our traditional customers, John, um, you know, FedEx, UPS, Amazon. Um, hopefully UPS might be interested in some of those, even though we didn't win that big contract. But, um, you know, Cintas, Pepsi, um, you know, the beverage people, the linen people, uh, even even some of the the larger power companies, uh, we think would be interested. interesting. And what what was really interesting when we announced it in June of last year, uh, we received some calls from motorhome companies down in Elkhart, Indiana. We also heard from some shuttle bus companies, right, for so hotels or airports or something where uh, you know class three chassis is a much beefier chassis, it's longer life and. And Mark, you've been at NTA, you understand the, the difference between those, right? It's not a unit body. Uh, so it, it, it's it's more stout and uh, can handle some people in it. Yeah, that's a, that's very interesting. The, the companies that you mentioned, of course, are all big corporations. Right. They've got Wall Street breathing down their neck for their ESG uh, yeah. initiatives. What about smaller uh, fleet owners and the like? I, I, I've heard they're nervous Nellies when it comes to experimenting with electrics. And I think, um, you know, it, it is almost like you, you mentioned, build it and they will come. Um, I think if you if you look at all the auto industry um, headlines, right, of issues that they've had with batteries, and I'm not going to name any companies, but I think we know some of the issues out there. Uh, it's making people nervous. So I think, you know, the, the, the smaller people, uh, companies may not be that interested right now. They want to wait and see. And I think the, the larger companies are going to have to lead the initiative. Um, and those are traditional customers anyway. Mm -hmm. So you mentioned earlier that, you know, you were, you were sensitive to not wanting to um, step on the toes of people with whom you've been working with. Um, you know, as, as you know better than the others here know, um, you've got all manner of of truck manufacturers suddenly getting in the delivery space and i, I think if, if, if we think about one one aspect of COVID, it's been like we've all wanted things delivered to our houses therefore the amount of deliveries is just exploding and that means more trucks um you know how is it that you know a company that is brand new although it has this legacy it's going to appeal to customers versus perhaps some names that they've been familiar with for X number of years. Yeah. And, and Gary, that's why we stayed in the class three space, right? Um, 
those people, the companies you mentioned uh, in this uh, Southeast Michigan, typically are in class two, right? And they, they love high volume. Uh, when you get into the class three in, in a higher space, the volume might be 15, 20,000 a year, 30,000 a year. So uh, it takes, it, it's a, it's low production versus high production. And, and I've been in that high production space and it is a different animal when you're trying to build vehicles at high volume We're in a switch over to low volume. Uh, it's a whole different mindset and you can't use the typical tooling that you've used in the past or the robots. And a lot of it is the manual work. And that's why we, we have a great team here at shift. Mm -hmm. That's a great point, Daryl. Uh, big manufacturers are generally not very good at low volume. Unless it's extremely high price, exotic sports cars or luxury Hand, cars or the low. handmade handmade. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Well, I, I would even throw in there big luxury one ton pickup trucks that are easily selling for a hundred thousand dollars because they're towing something that's $400,000 behind them. So th there's money out there in that segment, even if that might be, you know, a midsize or a low volume segment, there yeah. are people who, who might be interested in something like that. Yeah. So where are you going to build this, Daryl? Uh, we're going to start building it. Um, so once we made the, the announcement in June, we started searching for another facility here in Southeast Michigan, and we have a shift innovations building which is our R&D center in Plymouth. Um, and it's big enough to start some low volume in there to do the prototypes and maybe some launch, um, some vehicles until we understand the, the demand. Um, and then obviously we understand internally how many we can make at that location. And then if we start seeing some, some uh, excitement in the market and POs come in, uh, we're already working with North Carolina, South Carolina, and uh, Eastern Tennessee. And, and the only reason there, Gary, is that's where our battery supplier is. Mm -hmm. um, and batteries are super heavy, and, and shipping them is uh, a lot of money. But you, you have the issue, how do we, if we build it there, how do we ship it to the, the West Coast? Um, so uh, our, our plan right now is East Coast first, understand how the demand is, and then I don't want to call it a, a micro plant, but it's going to be a, a, a single shift, smaller size plant, maybe 2,500 a shift. And then we're going to go to the, the West Coast with the, you know, cookie cutter type plant that we did on the East Coast, uh, 2,500 units a shift. So those two plants can get us between five and 10,000, uh, but we're going to have to understand the demand. And and we're, we're hoping, right, as, as the we get closer to the green initiatives and people find our solution to, to be exactly what they need. As I mentioned before, we're not making them change their process like some other vehicles would. Uh, we're pretty confident uh, they're going to be excited about the vehicle. We And at the show, frankly, that, that Mark mentioned, and I mentioned NTA truck show, uh, we had a lot of interest uh, in the vehicle and the chassis. So it's very exciting. Hmm. It's, uh, it's interesting. You say uh, Proterra is your battery supplier, right? Correct. I, yes, I thought correct. they were on the West Coast. I didn't realize that they were. Were they're you actually, talking Kentucky, uh, Tennessee, the Carolinas? Yeah, they actually uh, have a location there uh, that they're launching right now and uh, building batteries. They are from the West Coast, um, out in California, but they, they do have a uh, battery plant. Again, because they can build them in California, but they also need to be where the auto plants are. And most of the auto plants are on this side of the country. That's right. Yeah. And like you say, shipping batteries, <laughs> hey, if you can avoid it, you want to avoid it. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> yeah. They'd rather us ship them in our vehicle, right? <laughs> <laughs> right. That's right. Well, real good, Daryl. Uh, you know, we've used up the, the first uh, segment of the show here with you. Uh, it's very interesting. You know, I uh, knew about the name change from Spartan to shift. Uh, and I knew that you guys did specialty trucks, but that's all I knew. And so I've learned a lot here. And especially with your effort getting into to Blue Arc with the electric van, that's fascinating. Mm -hmm. Well, if, if uh, either you, John, you or Gary or Mark, if you make it to Detroit, if you guys want to, you know, we can take you for a tour to our Plymouth office, show you the EV vehicle, Blue Arc. And uh, uh, or if you have more interest, we can take you to one of our plants. Not a problem at all. Mm, great. That's great. Thanks, Thanks for the bro. invitation.
All right. it. You're welcome. Thank you for your, your interest in uh, the shift group and in Blue Arc EV Solutions. Appreciate your time. Thanks. We're good. We're going to take a quick commercial break and we're going to be back talking about all things automotive. All right, and we're back. Uh, I, I, I find that fascinating, what they're doing there. And uh, uh, it, it's just so interesting because so many companies are trying to jump into that space. I call that space, you know, commercial EV vans and trucks and the like. But uh, those guys have got a track record, you know. I, I think that gives them an edge on a lot of the startups. Which, which goes to his point of the anti-startup, meaning... <laughs> That, um, you know, A, they've already done it. And, and B, as you say, John, I mean, they have customers. Customers are familiar with their work. And and so, so Mark, I mean, you know, you're obviously very intrigued by these commercial trucks going to that show in Indianapolis. Um, so, <laughs> I, I mean, how do you read this? Yeah, uh, I, I'll tell you, I, I've never met Daryl before, but I, I really appreciated, um, I, I guess I'm not surprised that I what I appreciated about him just played out there in our Q&A and our interactions. He's very uh, focused on not only his customers, but solving problems. So if it doesn't solve a problem, he, he doesn't want to start talking about a different direction. I mean, that that's a chassis that could be very you know, plug and play, throw some dual rear wheels on the back, throw it at the RV industry. You could do something sexy and design and, and concept oriented and try to get a, a big play. He's he's not about that. Yeah, that isn't what he wants for his company. He wants to be able to say that this product serves my customers for what they need to solve those problems. And that and, and I and I appreciate that. That's nice because I don't know that I'm hearing the same thing from all the other manufacturers that are throwing their, you know, beautiful electric vehicle platform concepts out there. You know, the other thing is Shift is actually actually acting more like a startup than the startups are. In other words, they're all, you know, doing SPACs, getting a lot of money, building plants, putting in a lot of capital expenditures, and he's doing it the right way. You know, do it in a little R&D operation, build things, you know, you can get some volume, learn what the market is. And then if the orders are there, the demand is there, then move on to another plant. To me, that's the right way to do it. Yeah, it's it's almost refreshing to see that uh, these CEOs or these, any CEOs, whether they're new or, or established, they don't want to be Elon Musk. He doesn't want to be Elon Musk. Everybody else wants to be Elon Musk. I want to destroy or disrupt the entire industry. And that's that's not... The, the what he's communicating to us he's just like yeah yeah if we have to shift down the road we'll think about doing that shift that, did you get yeah, that shift on the road yeah <laughs> so okay so, so just to be clear so you know he's not competing with bright drop he's not competing with uh ford pro i mean is, is that what he was saying about class three and their class two or explain that to us yeah, well, well, just the, the class two, he, he's looking at everybody who makes um, essentially the personal use uh, pickup trucks that are out there or the smaller, uh, uh, you can't even call them personal vans, but the class two vans are the ones that we see most of the time uh, navigating through traffic and through neighborhoods. The bigger ones, obviously, are the ones that are being sold to cities and municipalities, the class three, four and five, which are the big trucks. Class six. I mean, th those are the uh, those are the garbage trucks that we have going up and down the street. So mm -hmm. it, it, they're basically broken down by class, obviously, by how much weight they can carry. A bunch of packages probably doesn't have to carry a lot of weight, but a platform that he's talking about, like he showed us, is something that he can modify and make. Uh, accommodate heavy payloads, maybe as much as 5,000 pounds or something a little more nimble where you don't, yeah, there it is. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Something a little more nimble, fewer battery packs uh, can maybe, you know, be, he might even be able to play with that chassis and that frame, make it a little shorter wheelbase 
and make it a little more nimble and comfortable for uh, those companies that need something smaller rather than something bigger that needs to carry thousands and thousands of pounds. Maybe just a thousand pounds or fifteen hundred pounds will do it just fine. Mm -hmm. Well, good. Well, Gary, I know you always have a bunch of other topics for us. All right. So, so, so I mean, and it almost seems to be all of a part. I mean, it's, it's, it's almost thematic in some ways. And so, you know, I, I was wondering, you know, we got the new cafe standards have come out, um, whereby um, the industry-wide fleet average should be approximately 49 miles per gallon for past cars and light trucks by 2026. You know, there'll be a, a buildup from there. And, you know, the way this is being played is that um, people buying vehicles in 2026 will have a 33% increase in miles per gallon compared to if they bought a car in 2021. Um, you know, we're seeing gasoline prices, Mark. So what, what what's gas like out there in California right now? <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, we just had a couple of great days in a row where the price for premium, I think, fell below six fifty a gallon in Yikes. California. <laughs> so, so now it's six forty nine, uh, six thirty nine. Uh, people are outside waving flags and <laughs> celebrating. I mean, that's a wonderful thing. Yeah, six six bucks is not a big deal, and it's been. A long, long time since we saw four at the front of. The oh my gosh, Mark! I hate to tell you, but uh, I had to drive down to Dearborn today. I passed a number of stations. It was three dollars and seventy-five cents. <laughs> three. Uh, I don't know. Now we still have four dollars at other places, yeah. but I saw three different stations at three seventy-five. Wow. So okay, so do you guys see this? as driving people to buy electric vehicles, assuming they can buy electric vehicles? It's definitely uh, driving people to consider it. People who, you know, before never thought about electric are, you know, especially out on the coast, but even around the country, uh, you know, what we're seeing is a lot more interest in electrics. That doesn't necessarily mean they're going to buy, but they're, people are definitely more interested in learning about it. Yeah, the, the curiosity factor, I mean, the curiosity factor, I think, was fairly high, maybe in comparison to the rest of the country here in California, or at least in Southern California. But um, I think now it's getting on some people's radars that I've come in contact with that electric vehicles never even showed up on their radar before. They were very comfortable with uh, focusing on their regular standard gas engines. But now, I mean, we've got uh, the government out here in California that's being very aggressive. I think 2026 is the target year for us as far as when the major push for electric vehicles being sold uh, here in this state is going to happen. So people are at least thinking about it and what they want to do. They're, they're still keeping their cars that they have now Right. A lot longer than they used to, but. Right. Well, you know, a lot of that's just due to cost. You know, yeah. we, we've seen uh, reports where people are putting a couple of thousand dollars into the car that they've got right now. You know, if, if their headlights have cataracts, they're replacing them. They're putting in new tires and brakes, uh, uh, reupholstering the seats even, mm -hmm. because a couple of grand into an existing car is a whole lot cheaper than any alternative buying new or even buying used. You know, one of the things I wonder about in, in, in this context is whether there will be sufficient availability, you know, between now and 2026 when the OEMs have to have their average fleet, right. Mm -hmm. Having these, this, this number of, uh, you know, average 49 miles per gallon. And, you know, as, as we've seen with the chip shortage, the increase in sales of larger, higher margin vehicles. And I've got to believe there is an inverse relation between the margin of a vehicle and the fuel efficiency of a vehicle. Um, how are they going to accomplish this, John? Well, you know, what, what the luxury makers are all trying to do right now is push their customers into plug-in hybrids, you know, so they get credits for the vehicle, uh, they've got the EPA sticker that on an MPGE basis gets them over the hump. But the question really is, is whether or not consumers are going to go for plug-in hybrids. So far, at least in the United States, they haven't warmed up to them too much. In China and Europe, it's a little bit of a different story. They sell better there. But uh, 
that that's what certainly the the German premium companies are are really banking on right now. Sure, they've they've got all their electric cars and they're pushing all that, but what they're really hoping is that they can make PHEVs work. Mm-hmm. So, Mark, do you think that um, things like the Ford Lightning and the Silverado EV and whatever it is that Ram 1500 EV, um, you know, John makes the point of, okay, our consumer is going to be interested. I mean, from the, from the truck people that you know and talk with, um, how are they thinking about these things? Yeah, but my, my sense is, is that they want their brand to have something. And they, they understand that the manufacturers need to have and show something, but it's not for them. I mean, there's Mark, still... what, what, what do you think? I mean, you know, Tesla's got one and a half million orders for the Cybertruck. Ford cut off orders at 200,000 for the Lightning because they know it's going to take them a couple of years to even be oh, able to, to, to yeah. meet that demand. So is it truck buyers who are going for these or are they pulling in people who would have never considered a pickup before I, I, I i'm sure there's a group of truck buyers that are saying you know what this looks interesting i'm i'm going to jump in with both feet and give this a try um but if it's just my sense and i don't have any data to, to back any of this up but my sense is that's obviously not where the the majority of the gravity is for that segment that segment is is very reticent about uh, normal truck technology, and they they're very comfortable standing back and waiting and saying, "Yeah, I, I'm very comfortable with what I have, so I'm going to wait a little while." This, I, I mean, this just might be per, part of the uh, the learning curve and the and the the time it takes for that segment to evolve and change, which it's very slow to do. So I, I think all of those people, the lightning people and the cyber truck people, those aren't mainstream truck buyers. Those are wild and crazy. A small segment of those truck buyers are the wild and crazy that are doing it. I think they're pulling from the, I mean, the electric people who now want to get attention and now want to maybe even maybe leverage some of that uh, pickup truck, I don't know, mystique for lack of a better term that they've never been able to have before. This allows them to satisfy that tech geek side of them, but also with an automotive segment that they've never really been able to access or get on board with, but now they can kind of be a part of that momentum. But I, I, as far as the mainstream uh, momentum of that segment, I just don't think, I don't think those are the buyers who put their name down on that lightning list uh, or even the Hummer list or even the Cybertruck list. So, yeah. so Mark, what do you think? Um, will the specs of these electric trucks win over traditional truck buyers in the long run? Much better towing much better payload capability, higher, higher, higher efficiency, unbelievable acceleration. Are are those kinds of stats going to be the kind of thing that will win over the traditional truck buyers? Yeah, The traditional truck buyer wants to make sure that their guy has the number that's bigger than the other guy. So, So numbers are not unimportant. But the numbers have never told the story. This is what truck people understand. The numbers never meant anything before, and they don't mean anything now. A max payload number is a wonderful number for a marketing guy to sell a truck to a dealer that needs to sell a truck to a guy that comes off the street. But the truck guy says... I know that max number is going to be a handful for me to drive. I would never let my son or daughter drive a truck at max payload because of how squirrely and how the braking responds and how that steering is going to change at that limit. So the number's fine, but that's not the real world thing that goes through that person's head. Same with towing. A max towing number is wonderful to have in comparison when you're trying to say, mine is better than yours. But to get in a half ton pickup truck and have a max trailer weight behind you is frightening 
And every truck guy who's ever towed understands that. Now, there's a lot of truck people that have never towed and will never tow. That's right. fine. But for the people who do understand what those numbers are and how important they are and what it feels like to be near that number, that's not a brag. That's nothing uh, other than a bragging right. Although I got to tell you, I, I've done uh, a lot of towing at manufacturer launches for yeah. new truck models lately. It's getting to be pretty good. I'm telling you, uh, the braking, the anti-sway control that they've got, the, the rear view cameras that make the trailer disappear, all that kind of stuff. Uh, towing today with new trucks is head and shoulders above what it used to be in the past, even 10 years ago. Yeah, totally agree. Totally agree. So, so, so speaking of numbers, so um, sales came out. Um, not great, but... Um, one number really. No, they suck. <laughs> They're bad. <laughs> They're not good. They're not going to get that much better. But but this I thought was 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 fairly astonishing. So in in the first quarter, Ford sold nineteen thousand two hundred and forty five Mavericks. Okay, um, nearly half of which were hybrids, by the way, which which is an interesting thing. But okay, so so nineteen two forty five was the sale of the Maverick. All of Lincoln was nineteen one forty eight, meaning there were more Mavericks sold in Q one than there were Lincolns. And another, and th th this is this is almost bizarre. All of Buick was two vehicles shy of all of the Lincolns. I mean, when does that ever happen? Two vehicles. I mean, just yeah. But even Buick sales suck. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it, it's it is what it is. And by the way, you know, I I believe that Maverick uh, is capacity constrained because of the chip right. shortage. I think they could have made twenty thousand a month. So, so sold Mark, twenty thousand a month. So so so, Mark, do you see that the Maverick in some ways? validates the need for a small truck because i mean i was looking at the ranger numbers okay so so in march they sold 8695 mavericks and they sold um 6276 rangers okay so 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 it's like what the hell so in, in for, so for the first quarter they sold um let's call it 17 and a half thousand rangers and they sold you know, 19,000, 19,000 Mavericks. Yeah. I, I think there's, there's the proof I mean, obviously this is a very weird time to be buying a new vehicle, but I, I, I think the Maverick has established itself and it, it looks normal out in the world. You, can you see a Santa Cruz, not a horrible vehicle, but a very different look mm. to that kind of small vehicle segment. I think the Maverick uh, is, has completely justified Ford's risk, and if if it was even a risk, it, it's a it's a good vehicle in the right segment at the right price, and they're getting the results. Mm -hmm. So, so do you think that the specs have anything to do with that, or is it the only spec that matters is the MSRP? Yeah, I, 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 I think we're we're always, um, at least I'm always inclined to, especially being a truck guy and kind of understanding that half ton, three quarter ton, one ton group of buyers that seem uh, completely uninhibited when it comes to gigantic prices for premium trim levels and packages. Um, it, 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 I'm almost, I've almost been conditioned to dismiss the idea that price matters because they're selling at least a lot of trucks that cost ridiculous amounts of money in my opinion. But but the Maverick maybe is the, the flip side of that. And, and that the number, even if that's not the actual transact, the average transaction price, that number is wonderful and refreshing and getting some people at least to say, hey, that's popping up on my list where before it may be something that size never would have before. Yeah, look, I mean, the, the, the Maverick's got the, the makings of a cult vehicle. The, the attraction to it has been across the board, all kinds of... Yeah, any kind of group, any kind of socioeconomic group, people are interested in that truck. And uh, Gary, I think it was the price and the fuel economy number of the hybrid that mm -hmm. made everybody sit up and pay attention. 
if anyone went out to test drive one, that was what sold it. I mean, I knew a lot about the truck going into the media launch of it. When I drove it, I, I, I flipped. I mean, it drives so well. It's so well done inside and out that, you know, it's, it's the MSRP and the MPG that makes you consider it. But it's driving it that is the proof in the pudding. It's, it's just a terrific vehicle. You know, what, one of the numbers that also caught my eye was that um, F-Series sales in March, okay, this is just in March, we're down 46.6%. They're mm -hmm. down 31% for, for the year. Um, you know, this gets back to, you know, mark your $6 a gallon gasoline out in California. Do you guys think that that could be a reflection of people now being concerned about filling up their tanks? I, I, I don't think how, I, I, I don't understand how it couldn't. I mean, it's, it's really making everybody think in a way that we haven't thought before. I think just in the truck segment alone, people are just being more deliberate. I, 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 I mean, the last time we kind of had this shock wave was probably when, you know, the, the economy took the nosedive back in 08, 07. That made people really think about what they were doing. But even then, I, I remember people saying, well, I'm, you know, to cut back, I'm not going to uh, get rid of my truck. I'm going to buy a little, you know, economy car and I'll drive that when I have to and then still keep my truck. So I, I, I don't see anything happening in the truck segment that's really showing them that they're going to get rid of their vehicle. And maybe that's what we're seeing in that sales numbers. People aren't buying that new truck as early as they would or as often as they would. They're holding off. And maybe that's where we're going to see the uh, the canary in the cold mine about what's going to happen over the next couple of years, that people aren't going to be buying as easily those big V8s that uh, all the manufacturers spent um, at least investment money in the last couple of years, putting into their heavy duty trucks. Hmm. Yeah. But, you know, uh, soaring gasoline prices, rising interest rates, mm -hmm. soaring vehicle prices has always been a recipe for a disaster for <laughs> car sales. Mm -hmm. And, you know, when you look at what's going on at Ford, it's, it's that, but it also has a chip problem mm -hmm. because, uh, Ford sank below the Silverado and the Ram, which that just does not happen. And, and so that tells me, even though uh, there's no question that the sales rate is, is dropping for everybody right now, uh, Ford just couldn't build the trucks. I mean, mm -hmm. when is Chevrolet and Ram outsold Ford in the pickup segment? <laughs> yeah, I didn't know that. <laughs> wow. Um. So in, in sort of in, in, in this theme as we go along, but let's let's go overseas. Um, so the Volkswagen CFO, chief financial officer, basically said that um, Volkswagen is planning to cut its range of internal combustion vehicles in Europe by the end of the decade by 60%. He also went to say, quote, the key target is not growth, we are more focused on quality and on margins rather than on volume and market share. Um, John, you've, you've been covering this industry for a long time. Um, when has it not been about margins and market share? <laughs> well, you know, look, on a, a volume basis, Volkswagen is the second biggest in the world, second mm -hmm. only to Toyota. Uh, so, I mean, do you need more market share? Do you need more volume? Uh, you, you could argue yes, but, you know, here's a company that, you know, what was the bill for the, the diesel emission scandal? $30 billion in, or, or more, right? And, and now they've got to spend even more than that. I think the last I saw on the record, they're committed to spending $90 billion on electrics. And so <laughs> you, you look at $30 billion that went out the door to, to pay off all this legal nonsense. I shouldn't call it nonsense, uh, you know. They were rightfully hit with these costs, but I mean, uh, now you got to spend all this money on electrics and now you've got to start looking for efficiencies. Volkswagen has nine different brands mm -hmm. and they've got to be able to feed those brands. 
And I would argue they've got way too many models right now. Hmm. And it, everything looked great when they were on top of the world and nothing was rocking the boat. But COVID and the chip shortage, now the war in Ukraine, everything's getting jumbled up. You've got to focus on profits. And, you know, remember, Volkswagen spends more on new product development than any other car company in the world. Last year, they spent $17 billion on new product development. It's a staggering number. It's almost as much as Toyota and General Motors put together. So, I mean, if you're a CFO, it's easy. It's like, get rid of all this stuff that's not making any money. That's interesting. Yeah. Uh, another company that uh, caught my eye that uh, this this past week, um, Renault, which is having some serious financial problems and talking about the possibility of splitting its traditional business and then creating a new mobility operation, which of course would be their EVs. And I, I, I looked at their numbers in, in th this shocked me that in 2021, Renault sold approximately 522,000 vehicles in France, Renault, France, right? It sold 482,000 vehicles in Russia and it's just, pulled this business from Russia. So almost, you know, nearly what it sold in France is, wow. you know, so, so, so John, back to your point, I mean, how, how does a company deal with that? Yeah, look, I, I, I never knew that before. Uh, Russia is Renault's second largest market in the world. Uh, a big reason for that is it owns Autovaz or a controlling interest in Autovaz, the Russian company. That's, that's what got it so much volume there. By the way, the Hyundai group, Hyundai and Kia also do a lot of business in, in Russia. They're number two there, only behind Renault. Uh, so yeah, this is a huge problem for Renault. Uh, they're they're going to take a massive hit because of this financially on top of the chip shortage, on top of COVID and everything like that. Uh, things are not going well for them in China. Look, if you can't play in China, you, there's no way that you can consider yourself a, a global automaker. Uh, and their partner, Nissan, is in much deeper trouble than they are right now. It's It's not making any money at all. And so it has to go through a major turnaround. And you know, Mitsubishi is a very weak partner, and that's the alliance, right? Uh, Renault, Nissan, Mitsubishi, they're all in trouble right now. So mm. Renault, they, they got to take drastic action. And uh, I think they probably looked at what Jim Farley did, splitting Ford into two groups, Ford Model E, which is all electric, and Ford Blue, which is all ice. Mm. And they probably thought, you know, it's a bold move, but we got to do something bold because just trying to manage the situation could lead us into oblivion. You know, it's, it's interesting. So uh, Luca DeMeo, who is the CEO of Renault, um, as, as these companies tend to, they, and I think Carlos Ghosn was probably the guy that started it. You know, you come up with this, this clever, clever word and then apply it to how this is going to be the transformative recipe for your company going forward. And so Renault has something called the Renola Lucian. <laughs> and, uh, Probably sounds better in French. <laughs> <laughs> I, I hope so. But it is, and quoting him, is about moving the whole company from vo from volumes to value. Hmm, sounds like that Volkswagen guy, doesn't it? Um, <laughs> quote, we, and, and now this is this is this is the this is the money quote here. We'll move from a car company working with tech to a tech company working with cars, making at least twenty percent of its revenues from services, data, and energy trading by 2030. Yeah, and I'm going to be the richest guy in the world by 2030. I mean, <laughs> you, you know, it's easy to say these things, and, and you got to say it too, you know, for the shareholders and everything like that, but lots of luck, guys. That's, oof, that's Gary, a tall I think, order. I think you've put your finger on it. We're going to see more creativity we're going to see more cfos stepping forward more restructuring more redefining of terms the auto industry can't keep going the way it's been and and we'll probably see more and more things like this coming down the road well so i mean over the years you've, you've spent time talking to guys at you know who are who are 
making internal combustion engines that go into Ford trucks, for example, okay, as, as well as the other guys. But I mean, so I mean, what's your read on the separation of the company in terms of here's the EV guys, and then here's the guys who are, you know, making the F series that's making all the money? I mean, how, how do you see that working out? It, 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 it's a, it's an interesting, um, I, I mean, if, if we kind of you know, pick ourselves out of the auto, auto industry and put us you know, on the couch with a psychologist opposite us. This is schizophrenia, right? Isn't isn't this bipolar? I mean, I don't know what what other terms to grab onto. I guess it's possible to keep two kind of, in certain ways, conflicting ideas as important. But at some point, you've you've got to start saying this is less important and this is more important. And that's going to have impact and send, you know, ripples through the company. So I, 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 I don't, I don't know how you do that to say we're not going to talk about the thing that makes us a lot of money, but we are going to talk a lot about the things that is going to that's going to make us money in five years, ten years, twenty years. I, I, I don't know, but that, that's a tricky balance to take. So to me. To me, at least living in the United States or in Southern California in particular, holding two very contradictory ideas at exactly the same time, I'm getting more and more comfortable with. So I I, I don't have a problem with that anymore. So that's great. L- living in a crazy place that other people pretend isn't crazy. Uh, okay, I'm okay yeah. with that. That's fine. <laughs> that's great. So so John, you you said that the March sales were abysmal. Um what do you see going forward for the rest of the year? I mean, okay. So look, uh, automakers sold 1.2 million vehicles. That's a lot. Anything over a million is actually pretty good, but you have to look at the seasonally adjusted annual rate, the SAR, and it has dropped dramatically from a year ago and even dropped more just since January. And, uh, so we're running right now as of, uh, the end of March at a, 13.4, 13.4, I think, SAR, if I remember right off the top of my head. That's not a good number. That is not a good number. For this industry to be healthy, it needs to be at 16 or very, very close to 16. And to be several million units below that does not bode well. Do you, do you think there'll be a change? Um, I mean, you, men- you mentioned interest rates will be going up. Gasoline right. probably is not going to be significantly going down. Well, g- g- gasoline um, will probably come down from where it is right now. Um, interest rates will will continue to go up. Uh, I, I think there is more demand out there if there's uh, the chips to be able to build these vehicles. And if dealers don't go charging crazy prices for it, I think people will come back into uh, the, the market. We've had Two weak years. And, you know, Mark, earlier you were talking about pent up demand. Uh, we're, we're building pent up demand here and it may not get released this year, but uh, at some point it will. It just happened. That, that, that's how the, the, the business works. But, uh, you know, looking at it this year, automakers and dealers will do well just because prices are so high. Suppliers and consumers are going to get clobbered. <laughs> Good news, huh? <laughs> we we should have ended the show on Mark's last comment because that was a fun one. I was at least optimistic. Yeah, that's right. Well, we should remind everybody that next week we've got Mark Royce, the president of General Motors, coming on the show. We're going to be talking all about their EV strategy. So uh, a shout out to all our viewers there. Uh, I'm collecting questions. Uh, you can put it in the comments section, or you can send uh, an email to viewer mail at autoline.tv. And, uh, I've already gotten a bunch of questions coming in from viewers and looking forward to that as well. So Mark, what would you ask him since we have, you what would I ask right him? <laughs> uh, boy, it's been a while since I've talked to Mark, but, uh, the last time I talked to him, I basically apologized for not thinking that. They should come out with the Canyon and Colorado at the same time. I, I, I didn't think the market was going to be able to handle that. And that was what 12 years ago. And he did the right thing. He's made a mountain of money on that. And now he's doing all this stuff. So I, I, I wouldn't ask Mark anything except just, just say, 
make your statements in any way you want, and I'll be I'll be your biggest supporter. Yeah. All right. So so okay. So so the so the Colorado first quarter of this year twenty one thousand yeah. six hundred ninety three better than the Ranger, but yeah. Canyon sixty one hundred sixty. Well, you know yeah. that's GMC. GMC's got yeah, many GMC. fewer dealers, and uh, you know, uh, same with uh, the Sierra versus the Silverado. It's significantly lower, but their ATPs, their uh, average transaction price is higher than anything Chevrolet does. So, yeah. see, but did I mention that Maverick sold nineteen thousand? <laughs> no, yeah, yeah, yeah. I can go there. But, right. uh, well, why don't we wrap it up? All right. Mark, great seeing you again. Yeah, thank you guys. I, it's always a, an education for me to watch you guys work. You, uh, you're very good at what you do. So. Well, thanks for that. Thanks. Okay, Gary, we'll do it again right. next week. Yes, we will. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, guys. Bye-bye. Auto Line After Hours is brought to you by Bridgestone Tires, solutions for your journey. Visit our website, Autoline.tv, where you can watch us live Thursday afternoons. Get your daily fix with Autoline Daily and in-depth analysis and interviews with Autoline This Week. There's all that and much more at Autoline.tv.